It's an honor and a pleasure for me to welcome everyone back for the final day of the Freedom of Expression Conference. Really happy to have uh, Peter Graven here today uh, to help us with the moderation. You had the chance to get to know him earlier uh, this week, a uh, moderator from Deutsche Welle TV. So uh, we're in good hands today for the moderation. Before we start, though, I just wanted to introduce a very important special guest uh, who has just arrived from Luxembourg, uh, actually the Vice President of the Advisory Board of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, Ms. Erna Hennekot-Schepkes, uh, who is a very famous politician from Luxembourg. Most famous for me, or the most important of her positions for me, was when she was Minister of Culture uh, for uh, Luxembourg. But she's also very much involved in the European Parliament, also really bringing culture on the radar screen. Uh, she's also involved with the European Cultural Parliament, uh, where really one of their mandates uh, is to actually also make sure that that cultural component of European affairs uh, is not left out, uh, in addition to the economics and the politics. So I just ask maybe if you wouldn't mind, uh, Erna, just standing for a moment, if we could give a brief applause and a welcome for Ms. Hannah uh, Gotchepkes. Thank you. She's, she just happens to be briefly in Berlin, so hopefully she can hear a part of the lecture and then we have to step aside for a brief meeting a little later. So uh, thank you very much for being here, Ms. Anna Koshepkos. And I would now uh, turn the microphone over to Peter Graven, please. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, welcome once again to, uh, to the day four of the Freedom of Expression Forum here at the uh, ICD. I was here on day one on Tuesday. It was a very invigorating day, and I'm looking forward to uh, day four today. I gather that uh, the other two days in between have been just as good. Uh, the first speaker today is Renata Schroeder, yeah? who um, she is the, um, the European director of the International Federation of Journalists, which is an umbrella organization of journalists, trade unions, from around the world, and I think I'm right in saying the biggest organization of its kind, yeah? Renata has studied in, uh, in the US. She studied here in Berlin, so she knows Berlin. She's here today, and as you can see, she's going to be talking about media freedom and challenges. The challenges, I think, is what you're going to be focusing on, media freedom and challenges in Europe. I think the focus is going to be on some very interesting countries, Hungary especially, yeah? perhaps touching on the situation in Italy in recent years, which we've heard a little bit about earlier in the week, perhaps going to Turkey as well. It sounds interesting in prospect. Here is Renata. Thank you, Renata, Thank for you. joining us. Thank you very much. I feel very transparent here, so... <laughs> But uh, no problem for that. Well, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers. Um, for me, um, it's a new connaissance, as we say, the cultural diplomacy organization, a very interesting one indeed, um, for putting together this highly timely um, seminar, this highly timely theme in times of unprecedented crisis. We all read daily. I think too much about the financial crisis, and that of course causes a lot of insecurity about citizens, insecurity about the path where Europe is going, where the international world is going, in a world of globalization of, and I think, and I'm sorry that I haven't been here for the last two, three days, you probably have to talk a lot about the digital revolution, about social media, about its impact it has on, on the um, historical developments in all these areas not least to talk about the Arab Revolution. But I will start, I will be talking more about Europe since I, as you rightly said, I'm working for the International Federation of Journalists, which is the largest journalists federation. Um, we are, I think by now, 108 countries. And the regional organization, the European Federation of Journalists, I've been working on now for almost 20 years, I'm afraid to say. And when I started the work, media freedom, though never granted, was not really a subject of my work. It was much more dealing with social and professional rights of journalists. This has changed dramatically in recent years, and several reasons can be listed for that, and I will try to do so um, shortly. Just to say you a bit more about what the IFJ is doing, actually we have regional offices um, in all the different continents. You can imagine in Africa the work is extremely hard. We have very often weak unions, weak associations who lack very elementary um, computers and, and other work. So we are trying to do projects very often with the European Commission but also with other donor organizations to help the local journalists to do their work and to do their work in their very courageous way. The IFJ, as other press freedom groups, unfortunately produce a killed list every year. And I'm sorry, this, ours is just in print now, this year a bit later. And it's been in recent years almost more than 100 journalists killed. We just had a discussion about what we had last week in Syria. We had two journalists 
who died. Fortunately, now we have two French journalists who could escape. But um, it is each year a shameful reminder of the risks journalists continue to take to search for the truth, and unfortunately, very often, the lack of governments to investigate and publicly condemn these murders, which often breeds further violence. And we have a big campaign on impunity. We led that to the United Nations with some success, but it's still a lot of work to be done in this area. In the OSCE region alone, around 30 journalists are estimated to have been killed in the fa past, past five years alone, a number far surpassed by those who were beaten up or whose life were or still threatened. And here I could talk, but I will not, about Russia. We have, as you probably all know, there have been many journalists killed in Russia. Our union there is actually at the moment building up a database to find out exactly who has been killed when and also to find out about the murder and those responsible for it. It's a very hard work and the politicians are not helping very much. I will concentrate, as um, you said, much more on Europe, the smaller Europe, the European Union and um, applicant countries. And um, I will use the member state Hungary, a rather new member state, and Turkey, two countries, as somehow negative examples and reasons for great concern. And excuse me if I may repeat some things. I think you discussed already Hungary in former days, but um, since I haven't been there, it's probably it doesn't matter. Repeating makes, keeps it us better in the memory. So what has happened in recent years? What has happened that led to this unprecedented acceleration with regard to the violation of core standards of press freedom? including in old established Western democracy. Yesterday, we heard some problems, even though at a very minor scale in Germany, there have been problems in Italy. I will not elaborate on them, but we all know about Berlusconi and his conflict of interest. Berlusconi is not there anymore, but there are still many conflicts of interest, I'm afraid. There have been many problems in France, specifically with regard to protection of sources, and um, even in Denmark and Netherlands, which are countries with a high tradition of, of press freedom. So I will just come up with some reasons, but there may be more. First, and that has already been discussed yesterday as well, there is the war on terrorism. The September 11 terrorist attacks on the United States has had a rather devastating impact on media freedom, in particular on protection of sources, on access to documents. We had this discussion yesterday. On data retention, there has been a European directive on data retention, which also has potential very negative impact on journalists' protection of sources. There's a raft of mass surveillance measures targeting journalists and media organizations as a consequence of laws and regulations adopted by democratic states, and that has to be said, that undermine a lot of the minimum standards set out in the, and I quote again what we said yesterday, the 1948 United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Second, there is a renewed form of open or indirect political interference on media, which often leads to self-censorship and an atmosphere of fear. I will give the examples later on. There is an increased media concentration. Most of you may know that you hear more and more of the same names of, of media owners popping up. Unfortunately, however, the transparency of ownership is not always there. So sometimes what you read, you do not know who owns this paper. And very often, it's not anymore, as it was in former times, traditional media families, organizations, but it's often in the hand of purely commercial actors. And this commercialization and monopoly tendencies, of course, has an effect on media freedom itself. The fourth point I want to mention are the threats on the independence and impartiality of public service media. You all know that public service media is extremely important in a pluralistic society. And in some countries, I think I can say in Germany as well, they are still performing very well and they are incredibly important. However, specifically in Central and Eastern Europe, it has been extremely difficult to create a genuine public service tradition. 
there were financial constraints, there's lack of democracy, there's a lack of reform will by many of those governments, and uh, there are many attempts also by the European Union to improve that, but it's not getting easier. In Western Europe, also financial constraints and competition with private media, often entertainment-driven, have a negative influence to the intended independent high-quality journalism faces. For example, also now, even the BBC, there has been incredibly many job cuts, even Deutsche Welle, it's not really public broadcasting, but I know that there are many cuts going on, which is very unfortunate because Deutsche Welle is doing great stuff, and of course it has an impact on the editorial work. So I'm coming by that to my fifth point, which is the increasingly vulnerable and precarious status of journalists. And I think it's important when you talk about media freedom to also address that. I'm turning again towards Central Eastern Europe, where our journalists very, very often are freelance journalists, young people, often without any contract, forced to do taxi or whatever work at the site, doing it because of passion, but sometimes failing because of lack of income and also lack of training. And that has, of course, an impact on the quality of journalism and also on media freedom. And the lot job losses in large number of, of um, media, of course, also has a problem on that. For example, in Hungary last year, they cut half of the workforce at um, Hungarian public television, which you can imagine what impact that has. The sixth point, and that's, I will not go into that, but I guess you discussed that as well, are the new challenges and how to ensure the internet regulation. And unfortunately, governments become very creative sometimes in terms of blocking internet access. We have that in Turkey, but we have that in, in other countries as well, more outside Europe. However, we had interesting discussions yesterday also in the Baltics. We still have, and this is the seventh point, we have the problem of defamation that has also been discussed, that most Western European countries are still decriminalizing criminalizing defamation, so it stands under the penal code. And even though it's not really used very often, it has a potential chilling effect on media, and it's not showing a good way to the countries in transition who should decriminalize defamation. That has been asked by the Council of Europe, by the OSC media representative, and many other organizations. And last but not least is the question of access to documents. But again, I think most of you were there yesterday. Also there, it's not very promising. Transparency and the people's right to know is not always being taken seriously by governments, but it's also not always being used enough by the citizens themselves, including journalists. As Tanya Fayon, member of the European Parliament and vice chair of its intergroup on media, at a recent conference said, we are quite concerned by the deteriorating conditions of press freedom in a number of EU countries, in particular in some of the new member states like Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary. In recent years, we have recorded growing political pressure, harassment, and even attacks against journalists. The lack of transparency in the ownership of the media, the economic crisis, the right of right-wing populist movements have created a worrying environment for the exercise of independent journalists. The recent example of Hungary, which you may have already pointed out, has been for us a test case to see whether the European Union and its institutions are taking media freedom indeed seriously. Though there is, in theory, the legally binding fundamental rights charter, since we have adopted the Lisbon Treaty, which is Article 11, and I quote, on safeguarding the freedom and pluralism of media, freedom of expression and freedom to receive and communicate information without interference or pressure from public authorities. In the case of Hungary, the responsible commissioner for digital media, Nelly Cruz, could only refer to the audiovisual media directive, which is part of the EU ACQUI, the adopted legislation, and thus was only able to enforce cosmetic changes to the media law. When we talked about the Fundamental Rights Charter and the need to get this enforced, they talk, told us about secondary legislation, and we are still not sure why we have the Fundamental Rights Charter and how far we can use it. For those of you <coughs> who are not aware of what has been happening or what is at stake in Hungary, when Hungary last year was taking for the first time ever the EU presidency, parliamentarians in Budapest agreed to create a new media council, 
which has the power to fine newspapers if they don't provide balanced reporting. We yesterday had a discussion in Romania, this question of good and bad coverage, but here they talk about balanced report coverage. Hungary's media watchdog, the National Media and Info Communications Authority, it is called, is stuffed with appointees of the Fidesz, of the ruling party. It has ordered, for example, blocks to register under the new law, although it is not clear what sanctions will follow in case they refuse. And according to our journalists in, in Hungary, who already did, together with some foundations and universities on some studies, what has happened since this law has been uh, adopted last year, there has been a clear decrease in news reporting in newspapers. So there's much more about entertainment news, infotainment, but the news reporting, which has a potential danger when you get to this law, has been decreased. And that, I think, we can call self-censorship. So this reminded many organizations and citizens of the times of the political controls of journalism and media during the communist era. But if it had not been for this mediatic coincidence of the Hungarian presidency, this completely unaccepted media law may have only been a footnote in European media and not much worth much political action at EU level. Because we've seen many other countries where similar things have happened and has not had such a coverage. However, and I think that's also important to say, and it's very important for us to keep the work going and to say it's not all negative, there is hope, there is a dynamic. It has created a momentum within EU institutions and press freedom groups and also civil society groups in Europe, in Brussels, but also in different countries. There has been a lot of reaction in Austria, in Slovakia, in Germany, in Ireland, from our members, from other people. So we cannot say there is indifference. For example, on October 23rd, thousands demonstrated in Budapest in defense of press freedom. And that's been something worth noting because our member said there hasn't been really a, a tradition of going on the streets that much. So the Hungarians are standing up. Another point worth noting is that last December, the country's constitutional court struck down a provision that would have obliged journalists to reveal their sources. So at least that was one other important change to the media law. So this Hungarian case indicates two things. On the one hand, the, United, the European Union remains wary of putting in place the mechanisms that would force member states to respect the values and standards laid out in the Lisbon Treaty and its Fundamental Rights Charter, as well as all the legislation coming from the Council of Europe, the case laws from, from the European Court of Human Rights. The European Commission has only requested technical aspects of the law although the Hungarian government was directly challenging the fundamental values of the, un of the European Union. It's also worth noticing there have been a lot of meetings, conferences, resolutions within the European Parliament, which on the one hand has been positive because they got adopted, but without the support of the European People's Party. The PPE, which is the largest group um, in the Parliament, and as Fidesz is member of that, as Berlusconi is member of that, Unfortunately, all of the MEPs of this party did not favor to do anything on Hungary, which we thought was a very disappointing because it shows that many within the European Parliament are still thinking much more in political terms than they should be. And as I said, on the other hand, it has created a new momentum with the EU. It has shown that press freedom matters. Also, the commissioners are showing a much more interest in, in this subject. For example, Commissioner Fühler, responsible for enlargement, has made this point clear that many recent occasions that, um, and exactly, there is also last year there, um, the Commission launched a high-level group on media freedom that has also criticized, for example, what's happening in, in Hungary very often, and we very closely follow now what this high-level group on media freedom will propose in the coming months. So, I will not say much more on other cases. I could talk about Romania, I could talk about Bulgaria, I could also talk about corruption problems and, and um, many other problems. I could talk, talk about France, about Italy, but I don't want to do that. 
I just, but as I just said, the European Commission promises to be tougher in its negotiations with the remaining candidate countries, and we do appreciate that. Concern for press freedom, for example, is guiding the assessment of Turkey's conformity with EU standards. And this is now where I will just tell a little bit about Turkey, an extremely serious situation, which is also very close to my heart, as I have witnessed uh, myself a court case and talked with members of families who are in prison. I've been uh, to Turkey in the last two years for three times. Thank you. And um, I've been very shocked by, by the situation there. In fact, Turkey has an extremely horrifying and at the same time complex scenario. Turkey, which has reinforced its economic power and is playing an increasingly active role on the international scene, has in recent years shown a complete disrespect for journalists and their work. As a journalist in Istanbul told me, Turkey is more open than before, but on press freedom, we have more trouble. Journalists and press groups estimate there are 4,000 to 5,000 criminal cases currently open against reporters. It's a big country, but however, <laughs> it is huge. The cases involve charges such as criminal defamation, influencing the outcome of a trial and spreading terrorist propaganda, or being associated to a terrorist organization. These endless court cases and the detention of at least and there the figures differ quite widely, at least over 90 journalists to prison have resulted in a severe chilling effect. Prosecution have intensified since authorities in 2007 first detailed the so-called Ergenikon conspiracy, an alleged nationalist military plot to overthrow the government. This led last year to an international mission led by, by the European Federation of Journalists together with other press freedom groups in which we monitored the court cases, we talked to um, the families, we talked to politicians in Ankara, we tried to get a meeting with the Minister of Justice, which was refused, and we uh, concluded an action plan, what we can do to help, to help the situation, to get changes in the anti-terror legislation, which is completely outdated. And um, part of the action plan has to adopt journalists in prisons. Since we have so many, many of our member unions have adopted the journalist. We put it on Facebook with a picture. We described what the journalist, uh, how long he, has he or she has been in prison. Then our unions write personal letters to the families. And this is just a small way of solidarity, but it impersonalizes a little bit each destiny. And I would like to share with you a letter we just received from a journalist who has just been to court and he's been adopted by the Belgium Association of Journalists. And I was very touched by this, by his words, and I think it just shows how, what is, what is at stake here. So if you permit, I will read this letter to you. It's from Baris Tergoglu. I'm sorry for the mispronunciation who has been in jail since February 2011. <clears throat> Dear friends, you gave me the courage and strength to end my words in my court defense with the following. And he's writing that to the Belgian Union. If you ask what is law, we probably have to say that it is mostly about the applications. No matter what the written law is, if people thinking and writing in a certain way are continuously investigated and imprisoned, then it means that thinking and writing this way is forbidden. Unfortunately, this is what happened to us as well. It is critical journalism that is forbidden in these courts, and it is critical journalism that is being destroyed with such cases. I will say this again and again. I and I confidentially can say that we wrote what we believe to be right. As a news director, regardless of whether I agree or disagree with the ideas or the writings of our authors, I take full responsibility for what our authors have written. In my defense, I explained in detail and defended every one of the articles, news and analysis. In the end, my writings reflect my thoughts. I also want you to acknowledge this. If you release me today, I will sit on the stairs of this very courthouse and write the same news and articles again. Even if I stay in prison for 100 years, the day I get released, I will insist on the same thoughts. 
If I lose my right arm, I will write my thoughts with my left arm. I do not need an organization, instructions or orders to do these. As you can see, for almost a year now, I'm separated from all other suspects and I continue to write the same thoughts which I considered as crime. One is not defined by his genes but by his actions. And I am who stems from the tips of my fingers. I cannot become someone else with the fear of prison, police threat or prosecutor's punishment. I cannot exchange the freedom of my body with the slavery of my soul. If what is expected by these hearings is this, and this, what I think is expected, I'm turning the exchange offer down. Now, not only for myself, but for all suspects and for my country, if it is in your hands, I demand justice. Our words were not enough to earn our freedom. Our next hearing is on 12th March. I believe that no matter what it takes, freedom will rightfully be with us someday. We will actually be at this March 12th at the next hearing and follow that. At this very moment, there is a demonstration in Turkey because there are two famous journalists, Ahmed, no, I, I, two, two famous journalists who have been now for 100 days in prison, and there's a huge demonstration at Taksim Square today in Istanbul. So just some final remarks because <laughs> before I finish. I think, and I just want to be positive at the end because I have been a bit negative, um, there is still a lot to defend here in the core of, of Europe in, in, um, in, within the EU and not other countries. And um, I think this is important to, to continue doing that, as we said yesterday from the Axel Springer um, Academy, especially to get the young people well trained and to make them know their their rights and duties and defend them with all their passion. I think this session yesterday was extremely useful uh, for that. It was the Springer Academy. And the second point, and I think that's why meetings like this are so valid, there are new ways of cooperating together, of networking together, of using the social media for our demands and to getting much more transparency out there to get single cases, I think, out um, and get people moving, and that's um, something very positive we, we will continue to use. And the last point is, I don't think we need new laws that was also mentioned yesterday. It's not a question of laws. There are many very good laws out there. There's a whole acquis within the Council of Europe. I think it will be also discussed later on. Um, but we need these laws to be implemented. We need them to be known by all the different actors. There has to be training on that. And we have to convince the politicians that in the end it's in their interest. For example, yesterday we had the question of access to documents. It is proven the more transparency, the less corruption. It's not for anything that the Nordic countries are the least when it comes to corruption. But it seems this is still a very difficult way to go. Thank you. <laughs>